you have questions, just okay. shout them out. I'm happy to uh, talk. I really appreciate you coming. And I think it's an important topic. Um, I've done talks like this in the past and pretty well attended. So uh, we'll see. I can just try to get the word out. Um, so it is a very common disease in our companion animals. So just quickly, um, my name is Ann Caulfield. I'm a veterinarian. I graduated from Penn. In 1995, and uh, ran the rehab service at the university for a few years, and now I'm in private practice. So I've dealt a lot with arthritic animals and the consequences of end-stage arthritis, uh, mostly dogs and some cats. And it really, you know, kind of brought home the message to me that we need to be getting the word out to pet owners on recognizing early signs of arthritis so that we can intervene and teach pet owners, pet parents to intervene uh, sooner than later, I mean, you know, then we can improve the quality of life and maintain a quality of life for a lot longer than if we wait to uh, end stage. So, anyway, arthritis, very common. We see it pretty much across all species lines. People, cats, birds, anybody with what we call diarthrial joints. So most of our joints in our uh, our legs, our arms, spine. Um, these are very conservative estimates. 20% of, of dogs in the United States, 22 to 90%. There's a huge range there because we just relatively recently recognizing that cats get arthritis and they actually get it very commonly and they get it early in life. Um, we used to never really think they got it because we weren't just smart, we weren't smart enough to read the signs they were showing us. Uh, when you take your dog for a walk and you notice them limping, it kind of lets you know something's wrong. We don't tend to see cats, they don't behave that way. And then uh, about 80% of people over the age of 55 do have arthritis in one or more joints. And we think of it as a disease, or we should think of it as a disease, and not just affecting the joints. We need to look at the whole picture here. So this little zoom in is of the joint itself. So we're talking about the joint capsule, which is really this area here and everything within it. There's synovial fluid, which cushions and glides and creates that nice slick uh, gliding surface within the joint capsule. Uh, the subchondral bone, which is underneath the, the cartilage, which is represented in green here. So that nice highland gliding cartilage that gets worn and eroded away with arthritis. Um, so the bone underneath that, the periarticular are the muscles and the tendons and the ligaments that are all around the whole joint. So we have to remember there's a big impact on those structures with arthritis, certainly the cartilage itself. Hi, come on in. <laughs> Yay, you're here. <laughs> um, so we're just describing arthritis as in thinking of it as a disease process affecting not just the cartilage, but this whole joint and thinking of it as a system. Um, and the nervous system too, because with chronic pain of arthritis, we now know there's a syndrome called wind-up syndrome where we actually, when the body lives with chronic pain, it gets this constant input, uh, nervous input of pain information, we'll get anatomical changes in the nervous tissue. So, uh, you'll get more pain receptors that are formed and they'll be um, much more ready to react so it takes less pain input to get them to fire. And that's just all a consequence of living with chronic pain. Um, and once that happens, it's very difficult to get back under control. So we really want to try to get in here and prevent that from happening. And how does it start? Everybody wants to know, well, my dog's two years old and we take an x-ray and we see signs of arthritis. Um, because we always think of it as being an older, uh, a disease of older people, older animals. And it's true, most of the time, particularly in people, you tend to see arthritis with, with the aging process. Um, but in dogs particularly, we can see it even early on. And it starts usually with joint instability. So very common. Uh, disease we see in dogs, particularly larger breed dogs, is cruciate ligament injuries. I don't know if anybody's had a dog with, with 
those uh, Labrador Retrievers, we see them a lot, a lot of these, these bigger dogs. So when that cruciate ligament is torn or partially torn, you start to get some laxity and some abnormal movement in the joint, uh, resulting in arthritis. Or you can have anatomical joint incongruities. So usually these are genetic, the hip dysplasias and the elbow dysplasias. So in this picture here, this is an x-ray of the normal hip sitting nicely, nice and tightly in its little hip socket. And then the dysplastic hip, which at this point has really undergone a lot of remodeling. It's very abnormal and it's not really sitting in the, the socket like it should be. And then the same with the elbow. Uh, elbow dysplasias, it's usually a kind of a combination of several different disorders that happen. Um, really painful and comfortable, and elbows are really a difficult joint to manage when there's arthritis. So really what's happening is you get this joint instability. That alters your, the biomechanics, so when you're standing or walking on an unstable joint, um, the forces going through that joint are no longer normal. So you get stretching and swelling of that joint capsule that we pointed out. That's going to stimulate pain receptors. The cartilage has no pain receptors. All the pain receptors are in the synovium, which is the lining of this joint capsule, and then in the bone itself. And then you get the release of these inflammatory mediators. And those, the inflammatory mediators, these chemicals that are released when there's damage uh, or injury are really the, the perpetuators of this whole process. And they perpetuate the state of chronic inflammation um, that incites this progressive and, and that permanent damage that's done to that whole joint system. What they do is they disrupt the normal repair and the healing process within the joint. So you get loss of cartilage, you get abnormal bone remodeling as the body tries to, to repair itself. The joint capsule gets thickened so you lose flexibility in the joint. You get tendon and ligament contractures because you're walking differently or the animal's using the leg differently. Significant muscle atrophy. Uh, it's just this vicious cycle and then that chronic pain. And this is a little, it's a little blurry, I know, um, just kind of depicts some of the things we just talked about that happens with arthritis. So you get this thinning of the cartilage itself. You can see the bone gets these little jagged edges on it as it tries to remodel itself, tries to stabilize itself. The synovium, the lining of the joint capsule gets really swollen and painful. And you have all this, this stew and, and these inflammatory mediators all just kind of circulating in there. And as that progresses, quality of life diminishes. And these animals are in pain, they're losing mobility, and mobility is everything to an animal. So it's our number one cause of chronic pain in our, our domestic pets. Um, early recognition, this is the biggest thing that I really want to cut as a take home message is early recognition can lead to treatment, early treatment, um, and more successful management. We wait until they're really struggling to get up, really lost a lot of muscle mass. They're in a pretty deep hole. It can be you know, a lot tougher to, to kind of help them at that point. And the pet owner, the pet parent, is really the one that's going to be picking up these early signs of, uh, of some arthritic changes. So. I think that's, you know, that again is the key message here. And this kind of just getting old, I hear that a lot, you know, uh, the dog will come in, it'll just look a little bit stiff, and we'll kind of talk about that in the visit, and uh, the RV will say, well, they're, they're just getting old, you know, they're just getting old. Um, but you really want to kind of question yourself when you start to see some of these things, and maybe um, be thinking about this, this arthritic process, and what should we be doing now, and just kind of at that stage where it's a little bit of stiffness. So, you know, that's what a lot, of, a lot of times you'll see in the beginning. They first get up, they're a little bit stiff, but as they move around a couple of minutes, they tend to warm out of it. Or maybe they're a little bit more stiff after they went out and exercised a little bit more than usual. Um, 
but within a day or so they recover. Um, you, you know, maybe as it progresses, you'll see some distinct lamenesses that could be persistent or again, just worse upon rising or after exercise where they start to change how they actually walk or move. They're trying to compensate. Animals are just masters at compensating uh, for um, things like arthritis or muscle injuries and things like that. They might be hesitant to jump onto the furniture, into the car, um, go up or down the stairs. And, and I really stress hesitant because it's not that they won't do it. I mean, they have to really be hurting or really weak before they'll, they'll stop doing those things. But if they just stop and think about it for a few seconds, um, whereas before, you know, they used to just leap up onto, uh, onto the bed. This is particularly true of the cats uh, because everything cats do is very subtle. So if you don't tend to see them in their windowsill that you used to see them in as much, or they're not up in their favorite little perch in the house, um, or they kind of sit there and they think about it for a few minutes before they jump up there, that, that could be telling. Um, this is a big one. The trouble walking on slippery floors. You know, I see this all the time, even in, you know, in, in the clinics, the, the floors tend to be kind of slippery. And these, you know, particularly these dogs, it's really tough for them, these bigger dogs, to, uh, to navigate those wooden tile floors as they start to lose some muscle strength in the back, particularly. And then, you know, they don't, they're just not able to exercise as much, or maybe they don't seem to have as much, in, much interest in exercising. They might become more withdrawn, um, less engaged with the family members. With cats, you might see changes in litter box use. They might be missing the box or start to, to uh, eliminate <clears throat> completely away from the box if they're having trouble getting in and out of it or to it, or they associate being in the box with pain. Um, changes in grooming habits. So sometimes you'll see in cats, if they're painful or uncomfortable, they'll start to look unkempt. They, they don't groom as well. The opposite can happen too, is uh, we do see in dogs, uh, even if you've got an arthritic wrist, sometimes they'll just repetitively lick that joint. We think they get like an endorphin release from, from doing that. Um, changes in sleep patterns. I had a really astute owner one time tell me that her dog just doesn't dream as much, which means because he was uncomfortable, he wasn't getting into really deep sleep modes. So that was just something. But some of these dogs do have trouble getting comfortable or maintaining a certain position, so you just see them be more restless. Changes in appetite and can go either way. They can eat, eat more, they can eat less, and maybe you know they're a little bit more irritable. And that can tie into this wind-up syndrome. Um, you go to pet your dog, or someone goes to pet a dog, and they snap. And it's not that they're being wimpy, it's that now with this wind-up, with this enhanced pain perception and pain response, truly non-painful stimuli triggers a painful response because these nerves uh, impulses are firing at an increased speed, and also there's more of them, so that uh, non-painful input is being translated within the nervous system to really trigger pain. Um, one thing here. Oh, and again, these a lot of these symptoms or clinical signs are not necessarily just seen with arthritis. So. You know, there are other diseases, other disorders, particularly in older animals, that can cause some of these things. So you want to remember that. But uh, you know, anyway, it just kind of triggers a little red flag, what's going on in there. So again, you know, yeah, we talked about slippery surfaces. You can see his, his back legs kind of going out. He's sort of just tentative on on the on that uh, slippery tile floor. We have the little cats up there. Uh, they might, instead of jumping right up onto the tabletop, they might get to a chair. And then onto the tabletop, you might hesitate before they go up the stairs or jump off. Um, and then we have the pretty smiling, irritable dog down there. Cat no longer really grooming itself. Is that because it's painful? Is it because it's got thyroid disease or kidney disease? Doesn't feel well? We don't know, but it should be telling you something. Sleeping more, sleeping less, changing the posturing the litter box or how they're using the box. All those things, are particularly again in the cat, they're sending us little messages. We just need to, to be able to interpret them. And then just excessively grooming, maybe a particular part of the body, could be because there's some pain there. So we think of arthritis as being mechanically mediated, meaning you've got some joint instability. Uh, in 
cats, we're not so sure. We think it might even be similar to people where, yes, you can get arthritis if you went skiing, you tore your ACL, and now you've got an arthritic knee. But in people, osteoarthritis um, uh, can be a primary disease, and that may be the case with cats too, not always associated with joint instability, as we see in the dog. But for the most part, we think of it as mechanically mediated, but it's chemically driven. It's those inflammatory mediators that really are doing a lot of the destruction that's going on. Um, the, that cascade of inflammation is what really causes the damage, like we said. And you can see on the lower, really severely advanced arthritis, you can see all that abnormal bony remodeling the body does to try to stabilize a joint. That's what it would look like. That's a knee, a dog's knee on an x-ray. And then how you see it clinically. When you walk in, you see lots of muscle loss back in the back legs, kind of slumped down, stiff, hard for them to get up. It's arthritis, it's common, it's chronic, it's progressive. Like we mentioned in the beginning, we see it in, in pretty much every mammalian species, and it presents with a variety of signs, and, and getting to know those signs um, can be very helpful. In cats, we particularly see arthritis in the elbow and then in the hip joint, but it can be in the spine. Um, so starting early, that's what we really want to be thinking about with these guys. And a multimodal approach to uh, therapy, meaning there's, there's no one thing that we're going to do. It's a combination of a lot of little things that's really going to give us our best, our best management. Um, and it's not, not one size fits all. So it's really individualized. I do, I, I do kind of take it back and I'll, I'll tell people, you know, if you guys, you know, you're dealing with your dog, it's got arthritis, and if you told me there's only one thing you are going to do to help your dog, weight loss, hands down, without a doubt, it's been proven in study after study, in species after species, it is the most effective analgesic and pain management tool that we have for arthritis. This poor dog was named Butterball. Even as a puppy, it just, he just never stood a chance. Okay. So why are we so, you know, why do we emphasize weight management so much when we're dealing with arthritis? Well, it's clearly if, you, if, if an animal is overweight, they're putting more mechanical load on these abnormal joints. But going back to what we talked about, those inflammatory mediators that are released within the joint um, when there's injury there, um, these fat cells make a tremendous number of these inflammatory chemicals. So by reducing the body fat load, we can really make an impact on reducing those, those uh, inflammatory um, chemicals that are being released. So that, and that may even be more important um, and try to manage arthritis than weight reduction. It's a mechanical load theory of, of uh, why arthritis, you know, overweight animals suffer more with arthritis. It's also why overweight animals are more prone to certain cancers, diabetes, because of that chronic inflammation set up by those chemicals that are constantly circulating. So we use pain medications. Um, there's, these are just a you know, a few of the common non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs we use. Um, drugs really should never be the sole treatment strategy. Um, combinations of medications will often let us use lower dosages and be more effective in you know, treatments. So um, a lot of times I'll explain to people if we talk about using maybe two different drugs instead of just one, it's not because we're, we're thinking we're going to drug our way out of the situation, but when we put those two together, uh, lets us bring dosages down and more effectively hit those pain pathways so we get better pain control. Um, there are side effects. I mean, there's, a, there's side effects to everything. So we need to weigh the, you know, the side effects, risks there in that particular patient with the benefits, with proper patient selection and, and regular monitoring. The, they do have their place. I, I really usually use medications more in the beginning when we're, when we're trying to treat an animal that's come in for you know, more advanced signs of arthritis because unless we get that pain under control, we can't ask them 
to exercise and, and kind of do all these other things that we're talking about um, to help manage arthritis unless we get the pain under control. So that's where they really come in and can be helpful. Um, so exercise, we just mentioned that that's, that's a huge part of managing arthritis, whether it's people, dogs, cats, horses. Um, if your pet, you know, you notice they're, they're unwilling to exercise, most of the time that's because it hurts and they don't vocalize. So you can't rely on your dog whimpering to, to kind of convey that they're, they're in pain, at least not with chronic pain. You know, if you, you accidentally stepped on their foot, they might cry. That's an acute painful um, insult that, that you, you kind of delivered. Uh, but with chronic pain, they just adapt and they modify what they do and how they do it. They don't vocalize. So you can't really use that as a, a way to, uh, to determine whether or not they're in pain. If they're unable to exercise, they, they are trying, um, but they're just not capable of doing it. It's usually because they've lost a lot of muscle mass or muscle weak. Um, they've lost joint range of motion, proprioception, that kind of sense of awareness. You know, where your feet are under you in space, you know, when you've got severe joint disease, um, you've got these little nerve endings in your receptors in your joints that tell you where to put your foot. And if you've got severe inflammation and disease in your joints, they can be affected. And leash walking is like one of my favorite, favorite exercises. Um, it strengthens periarticular muscles, so all those muscles around the joint that act like shock absorbers, that act to help to stabilize this unstable joint. When you don't use it, when you're, not, when you're off weighting it or they're not using their legs, you start to lose that muscle mass and that just makes this cycle worse. Um, it will improve range of motion. The PTs in, in human medicine will describe uh, motion. They say motion is lotion for the joints. So by just gently walking and moving the joints, you're helping to lubricate that joint surface and to help keep the, the surrounding ligaments, tendons, muscles, um, you know, kind of flexible and, and stretched out a bit. Um, actually, I've seen this all the time. Once we can get these animals into a little bit of a low impact exercise program, we can absolutely bring down the, the um, pain medication levels, you know, using it every other day or just on an as needed basis, particularly if it's combined with weight loss, if that's indicated, helps them burn calories. And it's mentally stimulating, you know, which is really important, particularly as they get older. Swimming is a, an excellent exercise if they like it. It can be really stressful if they don't, so I you know, would never, uh, never really force it on them. But if they do like it, it's a totally non-weight-bearing form of exercise, um, particularly dogs that like to chase the ball. Instead of having them you know, do that ball chase on land where they take off and do this sprint across the yard and come to a screeching stop and, and then pivot, which is just is a disaster for painful joints, um, tossing the ball in the water and letting them swim out for it. It's very energy demanding though, so you, you just want to keep that in mind if they're a little bit out of shape, you want to kind of gradually work them into it, um, pull them out of the pool before they get too tired or they'll be really sore the next day. And also if there's any kind of um, lung disease or heart disease or skin disease, you really want to make sure you, you get a good assessment on that before you start an aquatic exercise program. But it can be really, really helpful for them. And cats too. More challenging to get cats into an exercise program, but if we, we kind of try to mimic um, their normal behaviors, we can encourage them to, to stretch out their little scratching posts. Some cats like to stand on top of the scratching posts having them just sort of reach for things. You can see how that would, you've got an arthritic elbow, it's always like this, if they're reaching for a toy, you can kind of get some stretching and extension. Climbing, I like that little cat post because it, it lets this little guy jump to lower levels and get his way up there to the top. That's a very important physical and, um, uh, I could say, emotional behavior. Cats really live in three dimensions, so they need to be able to get up high and perch to reduce stress and to kind of survey their surroundings. Um, making little interactive toys, not only can that be mentally stimulating, but it can get them to do repetitive uh, flexion extension of the elbows. And that's just putting some cat treats or a few little pieces of cat kibble in an egg crate. And they go in and they try to get it out um, in the playing with the little toys. 
Cats are not wired to play for half an hour. I know a lot of you know, hear a lot of people say, "Oh, I, I have these toys and they get bored after five minutes," but that's just how they are. Um, what you can try to do to extend the play sessions a little bit is to maybe have a couple of toys lined up and every 30 seconds switch them out. If you're doing laser tag with them, I think it's really frustrating for them to constantly grab at an empty light. So every couple of seconds, toss one or two pieces of their kibble and let them grab it. That kind of mimics a cat's natural behavior of catching insects. Uh, wild cats eat a lot of high protein insect meals, and so it gives them that mental satisfaction. Lots and lots of research being done on feline behavior and stress, <clears throat> stress disorders in cats, linking it to physical um, disease, particularly of uh, bladder, intestinal tract. So uh, if we can keep their stress levels lower by keeping them engaged in behaviors that are, mimic them, not only is it good for their bodies, but it's also good for their, their little brains. So the keys with exercise for arthritic pets, you want to keep it low impact, um, mild to moderate, depends again on, on the severity of the disease. Shorter sessions maybe more often are better than the big long, you know, the big long hour walk. Um, and you really want to modify it based on a daily assessment. Arthritis naturally has a waxing and waning nature to it. And so there may be days that weather affects their comfort, so you might be still want to get them out, but you want to shorten that, that activity up. Maybe they did something, they went out and chased a few squirrels, and you know they're going to be more sore, so you know the next day or so, so you just back the walk down. It's better that they get out and move a little bit, but you just kind of adjust it based on, on how they look to you that day. Um, ball playing, that's a tough one, but you know I know there are dogs that their life is over if they can't play ball. So you just want to kind of tweak it a little bit and maybe instead of throwing it across the yard, just toss it a few feet so they still get that, that sensation of, of getting it and bringing it back or not bringing it back like my dog does, but, um, um, but you're not getting that velocity and then that sudden stop and then that pendant on those joints. So there's ways to kind of keep them, change their games a little bit or get them involved in other activities like tracking or nose work where they can use their brains and noses it's not as physically demanding. Mobility aids, I think, are great um, if they're getting to that stage. And there's a whole variety of them. Um, different little slings, like in the lower corner there, which can be helpful on a slippery surface. So if you're going out for a walk and, and maybe it's icy, it just gives you a little bit of extra insurance there going upstairs. Um, the Help Them Up Harness, I really like this one a lot. If they can wear it all day long. It's very comfortable. It has a front and a back piece, so you can literally, like little suitcase handles, just kind of help them up, uh, up into the back of the car. Or if you see them struggling to get up, you can very comfortably just lift them up. It comes in different sizes, um, to, depending on you know, obviously your dog size. Carts, I do, you know, at end stage arthritis, I do use them, and I know there's a lot of feeling even among veterinarians that. Well, if you put them in a cart, they're not going to use their legs. And that's not really true. If they could use their legs, they would use their legs. So when I look at a cart and a dog that's still walking but having a lot of trouble, I look at it almost like a walker for a person. So this little guy, he can still use his back legs, but because he's weak and because he gets painful when he exercises, the, the cart just helps him move more. He can take a longer walk if that cart is supporting his weight. It also puts him in a more biomechanically normal position to walk, so he's not kind of hunkered down like this and trying to walk and straining muscles that weren't meant to walk that way. So he's more comfortable. Um, so I, I do like the carts, and you know I don't really just reserve them only for dogs that are totally paralyzed. And then finally, little wagons, or they, they make little strollers now. I have one for for my little dog that. If, you can, you can keep them mentally stimulated by taking them for walks, but you can also just give them time in and out of it. So maybe they can't walk as far as they used to, but you put them in their little wagon, take them for a little while, let them out, let them move a little bit back in the wagon, so they still can feel engaged and part of the, part of the family, part of the activities. This is what we don't want. Thing, home environment modifications, I think that's 
weight loss and home environment modifications are the two biggest things that I think can help these guys. And if th this, this reminds me of like a little magic carpet. And these guys don't want to walk on that slippery wood floor. So that's one of the first things that I really try to have people address is get carpet runners. Yoga mats work great. If you go to Five Below, get cheap yoga mats, make little pathways through your house. I have a little dog that I adopted that couldn't, she had a really hard time walking on the hardwood floors, but on the trail of yoga mats, she could run up and down them. So it gives them security, gives them confidence, much less prone to injury. If you're weak, if your legs are weak because you lost muscle mass, because you're arthritic, and you do one of these splays out on the, on the floor often enough, you're going to start getting uh, tendon and muscle injuries, adding to you know, complicating your arthritis. Stairs are a big thing, traction on the stairs. So, you know, little runners, little things you like this, you can buy and just tack down. Um, little booties, um, and, and some of them work well. Some dogs just really won't wear them. It really, really depends. There's a million different kinds out there. Um, usually when I'm just talking about trying to get something for traction in the house, you want something lightweight with a little bit of a sticky surface. Um, these are called paws, they're literally like little balloons on the, you know, on the feet. Any kind of footwear though, you want to remember, particularly with the, these little rubber paws things, you don't want to leave them on for long periods of time, you know, just an you know, hour or so at a time um, in the house, and then give the feet time to breathe and check them. I've never really tried these little toenail grips, I don't know if anybody has <clears throat> on a dog, but apparently they, you know, some people feel they work, they have a little grip zone right in this area that helps to uh, give them a little more traction. Just keeping the nails trimmed shorter will help too. Some place their feet more normally um, on the ground. You also want to make sure where they eat. Uh, if they're standing on a slippery floor to eat and they're, they're really engaging their muscles to keep the legs from going out, you're going to start to get muscle soreness because you're overusing stabilize our muscles, so give them some traction where they stand to eat. Changing the food bowls, you can look at these two dogs eating, the one with the food bowl on the floor and the one where it's elevated. Well, you've got elbow arthritis, as soon as that head comes down, dogs take about 60% of their weight up front to begin with, but when that head comes down, more weight is transferred to the front, and if these elbows hurt, over time that can start to become painful. So by bringing the bowl up, you're, you're changing the weight distribution so that they're not so heavy in the front. Same thing with little cats. This is angry cat here in the corner. And anytime you see him, these are things you should not do. And it's common if you've got dogs and you've got cats and the dogs like to eat the cat food, um, you put it up on the washing machine or you put it up on the table. But imagine if you've got really sore achy hips, or really sore achy elbows, or maybe both, every time you have to jump up there to eat, and then jump down and land on your, your sore elbows um, to get to your food, um, that can be very trying. And, and for some of these older cats, they just don't j jump up there as often as they should to get to their food and water, so we can start to see them losing weight. Giving them some little other, you know, ways to get to where they want to be. We want to try to maintain their lives um, and their activities as close as possible to what it was, but they just need a little bit of help. So the, the pet ramps and the pet stairs can be helpful. And then something we don't think about a lot, but there literally are pet crash test dummies, and that's what these two are, the Pet um, Safety Council and Subaru collaborated a few years ago and tested a lot of these pet harnesses, and actually the Sleepy Pod was the only one that uh, effectively protected pets in a car accident. Um, same thing with the carrier, the, these kennel straps are from a company called Kurgo. But what, what this can help is if you should come to a sudden stop, um, make a turn too fast, they're not having to kind of do this you know, navigation on the car seat or they don't get flopped around because that can make them pretty sore they do fall, and it's also just safer. Angry cat again. Litter box access. This is hard, you know, a, a stairs to get down to your litter box. It's a dark 
basement, maybe the heater's on, it kicks on and off. Um, we want to make it as accessible as possible to these little arthritic cats or just old cats in general to be able to get to their box, give them every opportunity to use it. Because if it hurts to get in and out of it or to get to it, um, they try, but over time they'll just start to, to try to, you know, they'll start to go wherever it's more comfortable. Using a flatter litter box where they don't have to maybe pick their legs up, their, their forelimbs up, flex, extend to get into it. Um, I've even, in an old cat I've had, these are uh, like the pans you put under a washing machine, the drain, the drain boards or whatever they're called. Um, I even used that as a litter box because she got to where she really had trouble getting in and out of anything. But this thing, she could just kind of stroll in and then stroll right out. So it worked really well. Clever, I, I don't know, I see these litter boxes and I just, for life of me, I don't know who came up with that idea, but the cat has to jump up into the top of it, go down this little hole, go in the litter box, and then jump and swing out again. So I don't think that's good for any cat, but especially not an arthritic cat. And then giving them warm bedding, if they choose to lay in it. Um, a lot of dogs, you'll buy all these beds and day crates and all this stuff, and they lay on the hard floor right next to it. Nobody knows why. I've heard theories, well, maybe that cold floor acts like a little ice pack on the hips or the elbows, I'm not sure why. But at least give them, you know, provide them the opportunity should they, they want to get onto some uh, nice comfortable bedding. These are kind of neat cat beds you can make out of a sweater if you're, if you're crafty. And then in addition to uh, medications, there are these other, you know, other products that are very popular. Um, these are actually considered nutraceuticals, which is kind of like nutrition and pharmaceutical pushed together, uh, like the glucosamine and converted sulfate supplements. Um, people, a lot of people take them. It's a huge business, um, multi-billion dollar business. And it, we don't know. We don't know if they work. Um, NIH did a, a very rigorous study a few years ago in people and found that the combination, so the glucosamine with the chondroitin sulfate, may have some benefit only in moderate to severe arthritis, not in, in mild arthritis. The good thing about it is they're very safe, um, relatively no side effects, and uh, they may help. So we do talk about, basically the theory behind them is they are flooding the system with the building blocks of cartilage. So the, the idea is that if we can kind of keep up, you know, in this race between destruction of cartilage and build, rebuilding of cartilage, if we can keep throwing more building blocks at it, maybe we can stay ahead of that um, cartilage destruction race that's happening. Um, disease modifying agents are a little bit different than supplements. These are actually drugs um, that have been FDA approved, which slow progression of the disease and. In part, we don't know exactly how they work. They have um, equine versions of these, human versions of these. But we do know that they do tend to inhibit these catabolic enzymes. These are enzymes that break down cartilage, um, while at the same time promoting production of enzymes that are helpful in building cartilage. Um, so they help you know, reduce inflammation and to rebuild. So the, the thought with the disease modifying agents that they actually do modify the disease so they can slow down progression and maybe help do some repair and at the same time make them feel better. Adequan is, is generally pretty low risk. Um, occasionally you'll see a few dogs that get diarrhea with it, but if you back the dose down, usually that resolves. Um, it's given as an injection and that's probably the biggest hurdle with it. It's usually in a series of once or twice a week injections for about a month. And then sometimes it's as needed after that, sometimes it's once or twice you know, a month, depending on how severe it is. So it's not injected into the joint, it's just given either under the skin or into the muscle. So it's, it's fairly easy to do, it's just a little bit more of a hurdle. It's not as easy as just giving a, a glucosamine tablet every day. Omega-3 supplements, I'm a big fan of those. And there's more and more talk about using things like turmeric and the curcumins within the turmeric which have an anti-inflammatory effect, boswellia, they all have a little bit of variation on the mechanisms of how they help reduce inflammation, particularly the omega-3s where um, they tend to outcompete 
the the bad, um, I guess you could say, fatty acids that are breaking, helping to break down cartilage. Um, adjunctive therapies can be really helpful too: massage, um, heat therapy, cold therapy, acupuncture, laser. I really like massage on the, of my arthritic patients. They really like it, and it. Uh, in a lot of ways. It helps bring in more blood flow. It helps reduce muscle spasm. Uh, muscle spasm alone can be really painful, so we can help reduce um, those spasms, get these muscles relaxed. Um, these animals feel a lot better and they can move a lot better. It's also very um, beneficial for them mentally. You know, I really haven't met too many dogs and even cats that don't like it. And they've done studies where we can measure blood pressure in the animals getting massaged and it lowers and these stress hormones, cortisol, that sort of thing lowers. Um, and the same thing happens to the people giving a massage, so it's a win-win. Acupuncture, another thing that's generally well tolerated, um, safe. I think I've seen uh, individual you know, responses, they can vary a bit, so some animals, just like some people, really seem to do well with acupuncture. Others, maybe not as much, but it's a safe thing to try. And uh, certainly, you know, based on the neuromodulatory effects that we're learning about with it, it's, it's definitely something to consider. You've probably heard about laser therapy. It's becoming more and more popular. Otherwise known as cold laser, to differentiate it from surgical laser or cutting laser or hot laser. Um, I think the preferred term now for all the people that study um, laser therapy is photobiomodulation because what, what it really is is photons of light at a certain wavelength that stimulate cellular activity. So it will help uh, wounds heal faster, it will help reduce inflammation, it helps with reducing some of these chemicals that are triggering um, nerve fibers to transmit pain responses. There's still a lot of ongoing research, a lot of controversy between what type of laser you should be using, um, what strength, what power. So they're still, you know, working on on the dosages and things like that. But definitely more and more, and, and most, oh, more and more veterinarians. I won't say most, maybe, are are um, purchasing lasers to have in their practices. Um, very well tolerated and safe if it's properly administered. Um, some of these more powerful class four lasers can cause burns if, if people are using them and don't know what they're doing. So I think this was a little dog, dog fight or hit by car dog I was working on. Um, you want to make sure that, protect particularly the class three and four lasers, that everybody's wearing eyewear, including that one. We don't like to keep them on, but it's important that we protect their eyes. Should have been back next to the massage, but we talked about that. Reduces anxiety, stress. If we do that and we bring those cortisol levels down, you know, the other stress hormones, they're going to feel better, and that's true of any illness. So it's really what they tolerate. You start slowly. You don't want to, if they've got painful hips, go right to the hips. I'd start up the neck or the shoulders and really just work your way down. Start with a nice light touch. And um, I'm certifying medical massage for animals, but you know, I just generally teach people techniques to use. It's nothing you have to go and get a, de a degree in or anything like that, but uh, I really like it with them. Regenerative medicine, you're hearing more and more about it with people, stem cells, um, PRP or platelet-rich plasma, and it, it does look promising, but what's happened with it, and this is on the human end, particularly on the veterinary end of it, the uh, commercial availability is really outpaced true hard research that's being done. So um, you can go and get PRP injections and, and stem cell um, for yourself or your animals, but the clinical research is, is trying to catch up with all these companies now that are providing these, uh, these kits that you can do. But it does look promising. Um, just simple hot pack or cold pack, it's ancient. I mean, people have been using heat and cold to, to help treat um, musculoskeletal conditions forever. Uh, but it's really based on some pretty complex physiologic actions that take place. So heat relaxes muscle spasm, and therefore you're going to help them be more comfortable. 
We're going to increase blood flow to an area, which can kind of help take away some of these uh, toxins that build up when you don't have good blood flow to muscles, and that creates more, more uh, spasm. Um, with the cold or the ice, <coughs> ice packs, it actually does the opposite. So it's going to cause, a, cause what we call vasoconstriction. You're going to get less blood flow into an area, so you're not going to get swelling, or it's going to reduce swelling in an, an injured area. Um, it can actually reduce the activity of some of these um, catabolic or destructive enzymes. Um, it also will reduce the speed with which nerves that carry pain responses to the spinal cord operate. So you'll, things don't hurt as much when you put ice back on there because you're directly affecting um, nerve impulses there. And it doesn't have to be anything fancy. I mean, uh, this is a little pack that you can buy with, for heat or cold called Bellas, but a bag of frozen peas out of the, the food, or you can make your own <coughs> ice packs with like a 50-50 mix of rubbing alcohol and water. It's really not going to freeze. It'll get kind of slushy, but it's very cold. You just don't want to, with anything, put it directly on the skin. You want to put it into a, a thin towel or a t-shirt, something like that. Um, with heat, I'm also extra careful. I always, whatever heat source you're using, if it's a, um, a heat pack or, or uh, those things that you heat up in the microwave, be really careful because they don't always heat through evenly. So hold it on your skin for a good minute or two. Um, make sure it's not too hot. When it's actually on the pet, I always recommend keep your fingers under there so you can kind of gauge. If they're older, you may not have as good sensory input to an area, so we don't want to cause any burns. They don't like the cold packs as much. Most of them like the heat, but when do you use what? Um, heat would be, uh, you know, for more the chronic achy, day, achy everyday pain associated with arthritis and that muscle tightness. Um, but when there's a flare up, they went out and chased that squirrel or they did something, um, or they just look more lame to you that day, ice can be really helpful for a day or two in an acute flare up of, of arthritis. So heat for the, you know, muscle spasm and kind of the day-to-day -day achiness, but when there's a flare-up, ice can be really helpful. You're still awake, you're still with me. This was a uh, Irish wolfhound puppy that had bilateral elbow surgery, and the owner sent me this <laughs> picture. He, got, he fell asleep on a cast and cracks me up with the little Jack Russell that's like, you big moron. <laughs> So just kind of summing everything up, we want to make sure we maintain just a, a lean, healthy body weight. That's the most important thing, not only in helping to prevent, but also to help manage um, arthritis and know what to look for. Really know to recognize those signs. It may not be arthritis, but it's, there's something going on and you want to have it checked out. Um, regular low impact controlled activity, modified based on how they look that day. Those home environment modifications are so important, and they're easy to do, and they're not expensive. Just you know, giving them some traction, helping them make it safer up and down the stairs, those kinds of things. Judicious use of the pain meds, the supplements, and then incorporating some of these adjunctive therapies. And that was a, a great Rottweiler, a, a patient of mine that passed away. The owner sent me this picture he took of him in photo. I think that was really neat. So. That's it. If you have any questions or anything, uh, it's like a little private <laughs> session here. I'm happy to answer anything. Or what is therapeutic gold that's better than just a regular gold thing? Or do you want to be like the egg crate type or the memory foam type things? Or? Yeah, just the ones that say they're orthopedic. Yeah, most of those are a lot of times are like an, an egg crate sort of effect. And they can because they distribute pressure a little bit mm -hmm. better than just a solid, um, you know, foam mattress or something like that. Um, I like the memory foam ones. You just have to watch because sometimes they can be, if they're really, dogs are weak, it's hard for them to get, stand up on them and then to get off of them. So it's a little bit what I, you know, I've bought so many dog beds and, and you know, half the time they don't use them, but I think they're still, you know, they're still good. And one dog, what one dog likes, another one won't. But just be careful it's not too soft and mushy because it can be tough for them to kind of negotiate a little bit. So, but yeah, they can be because just they'll put, if you're in the hospital, sometimes they'll give you a, an egg crate mattress just if you're 
down for a while just because it distributes your weight a little bit um, you know, less. There's points of, of where you're not putting as much weight with the egg crate, so it can be helpful. But having said that, you can probably go and buy that egg foam stuff and just put it in a you know, cloth thing mm -hmm. or something, blanket over it. Because <clears throat> they're going to be kind of pricey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you guys have pets with arthritis? Or maybe? <laughs> dogs? Yeah. 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 Dogs are mostly what we see, but we're really recognizing more and more, there's a lot more research being done on feline arthritis and how to manage, you know, how to manage them too. So it's pretty interesting. Rabbits, we see a lot, it's a lot of rabbits with arthritis. Rabbits love massage. They, they really do well with massage. So. All right, well thank you.